Everybody, thanks for joining Raindrops and Over to the Youth uh, sub series. Um, I'm here joined by Rabito, uh, founder of COVID Positive News, now rebranded as Conscious People's Network, and he is the subject to, for today. So, thank you for joining us, Rabito. How are you doing? I'm really good, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm really, really happy to be uh, talking with you today. Well, this is actually my first podcast, so uh, I, I chose you very, you know, particularly because you're a special person to me. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think we're we, we're, we're friends now, and that's um, uh, something that I'm really happy and also proud also that we've uh, found each other because, you know, it's really nice when you meet someone who is on a, the same wavelength. Yeah, it's been such a blessing for me because it I really felt like our two projects um, aligned and are good allies. So, yeah, it's uh, great to be on this journey with you. Yeah, and exciting to see where it takes us as well. Robito, I want to ask more about you than anything and your journey through um, pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID. And I'd like to start by asking, like, who were you before the COVID phenomena? What were you doing and what were your passions? Great. So what was who was I? What was I doing? What were my passions? Well, the first thing that pops into my head uh, with what, what were my passions was traveling. Traveling was my passion. And traveling was, yeah, traveling was my passion and my who I was, my mission uh, for a long, long time was how to be happy. So um, I started out when I was very young, um, almost as young as, well, yeah, pretty much as young as I can remember. Uh, with I had suicidal ideation and I uh, say ideation because um suicidal thoughts generally is considered that the person is likely to go ahead and actually commit suicide and i i never wanted to commit suicide it was just this inner feeling that i didn't belong here uh i talked in a um a, a conversation that i had with uh, dr tess laurie for test talks about how the world out there didn't make sense to me. So where I grew up in England, there was um, girls getting pregnant at 12, 13, 14, cars being stolen. Um, it was a working class area just outside of not the city of Nottingham in England. Uh, drugs, people walking around on a Friday night with baseball bats, smashing up the local wine bar. Um, that poor wine bar got smashed up every Friday night. And um, none of that made sense to me. Uh, and also people didn't have any aspirations. A lot of people leaving school at 16, not knowing what they want to do. But what I didn't mention in that, that chat with Tess was um, I also just had this feeling like I just wanted to go back where I came from. So even from like a really young age, I remember I just felt like before I was born, I was a lot better off. And the reason I mention that now is because, as you know, I mean, I interviewed you for the podcast that I'm doing, is um, there's a, a, a few people that have mentioned a similar experience. So I've come to realize this idea that I want to kind of just go back in and go back where I came from uh, isn't wasn't unique to me. Um, so I wanted to be happy. In fact, I was... I, I was it wasn't until I was kind of in my 30s that I made that decision that I was going to do I'm 45 now so to to to, to decide okay I'm going to do whatever it takes to to be happy and um, that led me to basically I went to a bookshop and I looked for 
well, the first thing I did was I typed in on the computer how to be happy, <laughs> which if you do that now, I don't know what would pop up. <laughs> but at the time, it was an ebook. And the ebook uh, was actually how to be happy and um, have, have fun changing the world, I think, was the name of the ebook. It was free. I don't know if it's still available. The, the guy who wrote it did change it so that you have to pay for it. I don't know if it's still around. But um, that book introduced me. It had a whole reference list of different books and different people that you could kind of go to and explore. And so I went to a bookstore and I ended up going to was the self-help section, I guess. But it was basically introduced me to spirituality, uh, introduced me to meditation, to the whole idea of ending your suffering and things like that. So then I quit my job, took my money, went to uh, uh, South America for my first journey away. Well, I've been traveling my whole, I'd already been traveling. I started traveling when I was 18. But um, my first journey where I just take my money and I can just travel for as long as I want. And, um, and then I went on this big journey, this big spiritual journey. What I did was I read all these different books and I came up with four different things that I understood at the time to be like the main core messages. And one of them was following your intuition. The other one was um, living in the present. So the meditation, focusing on the present. The other one was your inner child, like um, doing what gives you joy. And the last one was facing fears. So getting out of the comfort zone and peeling away those onion layers of fears. And I took it very seriously. I started a, a video blog, which had 60 subscribers, most of them my family and friends. Um, and I, I video blogged the whole thing. And then after years later, I took it off. So unfortunately, it's not available anymore. But uh, I wanted to, to just say, you know, like if I do those four things, as I understand them, to be happy, what is the end result? And just to kind of be, I don't know, an inspiration or an example of somebody who actually like just does this as an experiment to see what happens. And we can talk a little bit more if you like about the actual journey that I went on, but the end result was, the end result was I was in India, I was doing a holotropic breathing exercise and Afterwards, everybody sat in a circle and they were talking about, oh, I went to uh, four years old and saw this trauma. I went over here and I saw this trauma. And they were going around in a circle and people say, you know, so thank I'm so grateful that I found this modality. It's really helping me. And then when it came to me, um, I just saw lights and geometric shapes and felt lots of love and compassion. And it was at that moment that I realized that I didn't need therapy anymore in order to be happy. I'm not saying that we don't, well, therapy is a loaded word because it sounds like there's something wrong with you, but we always need to continue to release stress and to continue to do the inner work. And we're always on a journey of evolution, I believe. Um, but, and I don't think that ever ends until we die. And then arguably we, come back and do it all over again um but uh, but i'd reached a point where i knew that i was happy uh, and we could maybe even talk a little bit about what that what i mean by happy but anyway i reached that point and then um and 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 that well and then also so as part of that journey um before that journey so from 18 to 30 and then going on until the pandemic I'd always been traveling. It was something which was in my soul. Actually, I've even got uh, gypsy blood. My, uh, my grandma used to read tea leaves. And um, I don't know how much we want to go into it. But basically, um, when I was young, I was, I was, uh, my mom told me that her mother had said to her, if you want to like develop this sixth sense as she described she called it then then uh, then you can 
Um, and my mum said, no, no, this is too scary for me. I don't want to get involved. But when I was young, I, I actually would have said, yeah, I want to I want to know how how all this works. But uh, but I couldn't because my mum, the knowledge wasn't passed on from my grandma. But anyway, that 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 route backwards goes into gypsy blood or like kind of traveling and all of that. So I don't know if that's why, but it was always in my soul that I wanted to travel. Travel has been a massive part of my life. And then that all stopped with with the pandemic. So, yeah, who am I? I think uh, a traveler, a nomad. I, I've i literally spent no more than one year in one country or one place for the vast majority of my life. Now it's changed a bit since the pandemic, but I've been to about 45 different countries. So um, I was very nomadic and I, I was very lucky also. Uh, well, lucky, I, I would argue, synchronicities, you know, these things just kind of fall into place when you follow your intuition. But I found myself in a situation where I could work uh, every summer for a university in the UK teaching critical thinking, take that money and then travel for nine months um, with that with that money. If I go to India, South Southeast Asia, uh, Sri Lanka, countries where the currency is in our favor. And um, and I used to for nine months, I wasn't just I was lounging around on beaches, but not only lounging around on beaches. I also did work away. I was volunteering on farms, all of those different types of things. So before COVID, my life was uh, was was very different. Yeah. What a rich experience. 49 countries, eh? And For, I think about 45. And so I started out when I was 18. I, I left school. I wanted to get away. I wanted to get um, out of Nottingham. And um, there was a poster on the sick form. You'll, you'll know sick form from the um, schools in England, oh, yeah. you know, like the 16, 17, 18 at the end of kind of high school. And there was a, a poster for au pair when you go and live, a, live with a family and look after the kids. And uh, so I just, I phoned them up and just said, can guys do that? And um, this this organization took men as well, or bo boys, guys. And uh, so I signed up for it. I signed up for it a year in advance as well, because I was so determined I wanted to go. So when I was 18, I went to the States, um, did four days training in New York, and then I went off to Chicago. And I was different families. That, that year in itself is a big story, but one of those families was three-year-old triplets. And um, at 18 years old. Uh, and then after that, when I came back, I uh, just continued um, traveling. I mean, I ended up doing teacher training and that meant that I could uh, teach um, English and German in uh, different countries around the world. And part of it was a desire to travel. Possibly part of it was running away as well. Um, running away from not being happy growing up as a as a as a you know as a teenager mm. but definitely also traveling is still in my blood you know like I don't even now you know that I I don't need to travel I want to travel so it stayed with me my whole life I could only imagine how much COVID affected you in the sense of like all of a sudden the whole world was shut down and nobody could leave where they were. And some people weren't even able to leave a certain radius of their house without being um, molested by police. So what was that experience like for you coming into that two year era? Well, thank you for saying that because um, I've mentioned a few times to people that it was actually really traumatizing for me when um, the pandemic came uh, because it really changed my lifestyle so much. Like my whole, my whole way of life stopped mm. as it did for, for, for many other people. And for many other people, it was a different experience. But for me, it was suddenly, I can't go anywhere. Uh, I wasn't in England when it when it all kicked off. I was in Germany. 
Um, but in England, and a lot of people in England don't remember this because I brought it up with them, right at the beginning of the pandemic, before the vaccines were rolled out, they were already saying that if you were from particular counties in England, different areas, that you were not allowed to fly out of the country because of the, the, the number of cases in those counties where there were more cases, you weren't allowed to fly out, um, even if the country on the other side was letting you in. So Mexico, Brazil, there were quite a few countries that were saying, you know, you can come. But England or the UK, it was mainly, I think it was mostly England. I think Scotland and Wales perhaps didn't do that. But in England, certainly, they said you can't leave. And I just thought, well, that's that only happens in North Korea or in some totalitarian state or in a really poor country where it's really difficult to get a passport. Um, so that was a real shock for me because I didn't know at that time if this was the, you know, there was, uh, Trudeau was talking about the new normal, as were many other politicians. And, uh, and I didn't know if this was going to be the new normal, if like from now on, we won't be able to travel anymore unless we start doing things that they tell us to do. So it was a real, um, I didn't realize at the time, I had three days when I was really freaking out inside. And, and then, and then I found a ticket to Portugal and it was a five euro ticket last minute. And I jumped on the plane, went to Portugal and ended up staying there throughout most of the pandemic. But, um, uh, I, but, but I, I thought at the time it was probably just kind of like a three day trauma or a three day reaction. But I've I've come to realize that it affected me much more than that. This 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 whole thing. How, how did the experience affect you beyond those three days? Um. I was, I was okay. What I was like, okay. What can I still do? Because I I, I don't want to go back to England. It's not safe. You know, it's not safe because I didn't know if I would be able to just be able to fly out again. Um, I was in Germany, and. Uh, and, and I was like, okay, what can I do? So I decided to do the Camino de Santiago, which is like a hiking route through to, uh, you can start in different places, but um, I started in the very south of Spain, and then you hike your way up to, um, is it Santiago? Probably Camino de Santiago. So yeah, you go to Santiago. And um, I didn't get that far. Everything was closed down. There was lockdowns in Spain. I was just walking through the countryside with my backpack. I got a tent. I was camping outside, even though the hostels and everything were closed. Or the albergues, albergue, which is like the hostel for the pilgrimage people. It was a pilgrimage walk. And then I was like, I was in a tent. And I had a lucid dream. My only lucid dream it was really vivid. I noticed that I was asleep. And the first thing I thought was, okay, let's fly. And then I was like running across the sea and all of this. And then there was like um, three voices in my dream. One of them was, I think it was a female voice. And it, it kind of said, it's time to stop running, which I just understood as stop the pilgrimage, you know, stop the Camino, the walk and and just stop uh the the male voice i think it was the male voice that said sometimes people need to stop talking about it and build their castle um and i didn't know what my castle was um i'm still not really sure but i think it's just what's being created now and the last was like this distorted face which uh which said you know which was saying this is going to be really hard this is going to be really difficult and these two other voices were saying to me, Dan, don't listen to that voice. You've got all the tools that you need. So how this is linked to your question is, you know, so it doesn't matter whether that's like a vision or whether that's just your subconscious, just expressing how you feel. I took those messages seriously. So I stopped doing the, the, the hike. The next village that I went to, I had no idea what it was going to look like. There was a castle on the top of that village when I got to the next village, which was just a coincidence 
And um, and then I went to Cordoba in Spain, found a hostel and spent, I don't know how many weeks up on the terrace meditating on what is my, what is this castle that I'm supposed to be building? Um, but anyway, the distorted face, uh, a long time later, I would say kind of like the end of last year, I started to develop a little twitch here. And it was from the from the, the internal stress. And I, I, I read it as that distorted face was what you are now going to start building, which has been COVID positive news to the Conscious People's Network and the hypnotherapy and all of that, um, is going to be really difficult. This, this twitch was like my, at, at one point I was like, ah, that's the distorted face. Like it's going to, it's going to wear me out. Hmm. But what I also realized was that this twitch was probably also a consequence of that initial trauma, that, that initial pandemic, that there was, it had more of an effect on me than I first realized. And, um, so then when I noticed that I was starting to get a twitch, then I, I, I ramped up my being present, meditation, doing uh, swimming, we talked about before in the interview we did, um, just just to get my get releasing, get releasing that stress, and uh, and the twitch disappeared. But uh, but so I feel that it probably had a real big impact, much beyond what I first realised at that time. That and the work that I was doing because I was working way too much but um but anyway yeah i think it's i think it had a big impact yeah what you've done during in in your in your stand in covid with covid positive news it's really quite unique among things that were done during the covid era because covid was such a negative thing right so 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 much of the human conscious atten attentive energy and and creative energy went into very negative coverage of COVID matters, but you did the opposite, and you 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 put it right in the name that you're made a channel that is going to be about positive news regarding COVID. Um, what encouraged you to do something so against the grain? The first reason I think was because I had already gone through what people talk about, you know, waking up or the awakening and, and, and realized that the world is not the way that we've been told it is in 2001, probably when we wake up or when we have that realization, probably we already knew anyway, we kind of had that, oh yeah, I kind of sensed that before. But the big event for me was the war on terror was the, the, two planes bringing down three towers and uh and it, it just it didn't make sense the towers fell at free fall speed um it's never happened before or since studies have showed it's impossible uh, they were blown up um, it collapsed in on its own site it was a perfect yeah, demolition collapsed in on its own yeah, yeah collapsed in on its own site I mean, there's one study, I forget if it's from the Netherlands or from, it might be from the Netherlands that, that, that um, found um, uh, nano uh, military grade thermite in the rubble. Um, so none of that made sense. And then like, if you were kind of, you know, watching TV at that time, then they were looking at uh, going to the caves of Tora Bora in Af Afghanistan to find bin Laden in, in, in an underground layer where they said that he'd got Wi-Fi and there was this like connected terrorist network. And, and I live in a, I, right now I'm in a, a house that's 800 years old. The walls are made, uh, are super thick and the Wi-Fi won't go from the office, which is just down the corridor to this room. So how they're supposed to have a Wi-Fi connection going around the caves is beyond me. but. That was James Bond. I mean, that was a James Bond villain. And um, it was, I won't go into the whole story of, 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 of the war on terror, but obviously there was no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And uh, 
it, it, it started me down the path of going down the rabbit holes and looking at like, how is all this connected? So back in 2001, I'd already explored like how the media works and how money works and all of that type of stuff. So when COVID happened, I already knew that, that there was, you know, this pyramid structure with some people at the top who are kind of private organize private people that are in charge of printing the money and, um, and, and all of that. So it was a shock because suddenly it was global. Suddenly it was right in your face that all of the, the leaders of all the countries are saying exactly the same thing. So that was a shock, you know, that it's really now a global in your face thing. But I knew about it already. So um, so I didn't need to do any of that unraveling. I think that's the first thing. And the second thing was because of my own interest, because of my own journey, I suppose, into how to be happy. And also the fact that I've always um, I've always been able to look at objective facts and accept them as that's that's just an objective truth and i teach critical thinking so i teach at university how to look at studies and decide you know is, is this a weak study is this a strong study uh, are these three studies stronger than this one study or vice versa um so i'd already took an interest in all of that so basically i already knew the science behind uh positive psychology and so the idea behind COVID positive news was to, pre to, to present a way of looking at things which makes you feel better. And also because of my meditation and hypnotherapy to be able to support people through, although I didn't do any hypnotherapy for the whole first year of COVID positive news, I didn't do that, but my intention in the beginning was, oh, I could also offer some hypnotherapy for people that are struggling. Um, but that first year, I was I was just presenting a positive perspective, a glass half full perspective. And the reason for that was just to kind of show, just to, as an example, like just through people reading it, that if you focus on the positive, it has massive positive effects for you physically, emotionally, mentally, and also through not just positive uh, positive emotions and positive psychology, but also um, there's something called solutions focused journalism or constructive journalism, which is when you focus on the positive through journalism, that that also has been shown to improve um, our, uh, what is it, thought action repertoire. So our ability to be able to act from a, from a, from a, um, a place which is productive and positive and has a positive outcome and to be able to, because we're thinking from that perspective, how to create a better reality or how to, uh, focusing on the solutions, um, it also improves our ability to communicate with others that have different points of view than us. So there was all this stuff that I started to, first of all, I was just pre presenting the, the news from a positive slant, either, either picking positive news or just taking a news article and presenting the positive version. So if Florida was the only state in the US that was saying we're not gonna vaccinate kids, for example, and then, mo and then the the general way of reporting that, even in the the, the alternative freedom independent media, is that all of these states in the USA are not uh, are making it mandatory. So you just switch it, and you just say Florida is the state which is um, uh, fighting for freedom or fighting to keep uh, keep keep uh, you know uh, freedom of choice. And when we nurture that perspective, when we choose to focus on a glass half full perspective, and we have to, we have to make a decision to nurture that way of looking at things, then as, as I keep writing, or as, as I, yeah, as I still keep writing today on the channel, 
doesn't mean that you avoid the problems. It just means that you're aware of the problems, but there's always another way to look at it. And that has huge positive effects for many different, you know, as I said, emotionally, physically, and also globally. So the other one that I, that I stuck in there was some of the studies from quantum physics, quantum mechanics that say that our, the reality out there is actually a, a, a projection of our collective worldview. So if our worldview would be one that focuses on the positive, then that should be reflected out there as well. The world should become more positive. So, um, and, and the feedback that I got from, from many, many people was I can breathe again. Um, that was a common one, like, thank you for this channel. I can breathe again. Um, I feel hope again. And yeah, so that was why I did it. <laughs> And people that are charged up with positive energy, they're going to be more capable of making positive change. Like a, a tree, a, the, the fruits of a tree is going to only be as good as the tree itself, right? So what strikes me as COVID positive news is like your audience are like th these, these beautiful trees that through COVID have been abused and not watered and not pruned but with with positive information cleans up the situation and then all those people individually can go out in the world and make it better you know pay it forward yeah i mean if you if you're full of fear um then you're going to act out of that fear um so it, you know if you're full of fear then not not to you know, I understand this because I did it myself. I've been through this process. When, when, when I realized how all the dots were connected and things, I started posting on Facebook um, and lost all my friends. I tried to, you know, to share the studies, share the knowledge, wake everybody up. It doesn't work. When, you, when you're in fear then or anger, uh, then you 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 want to you want to share all this knowledge with everyone like look this is so important we're all going down if we don't know this we're all going to be in some kind of um, totalitarian situation um but it doesn't work and then of course also actually when you are behaving when you're full of fear then the fight flight freeze takes over you you're 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 not um you're not making the best decisions um, you're not communicating in the best way with others, the, the optimum way to, to create a positive outcome. And so, yeah, when you're focused on the positive, you know, the studies show, and I just mentioned the studies because it validates it, that, um, that, that the opposite happens. When you focus on the positive, then you're not running to build your bunker. You're focusing on how can we improve things what can we do to make the world a better place and how can we communicate in a way which has a most the most optimum result and how can i behave so that i am the most balanced or the most healthy and things like this so absolutely and the other thing i'll just quickly say is like i i see this system itself as an as, as an abusive relationship i've also been saying this since the beginning is that the system the system is 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 um not treating us with kindness and if you're in a relationship in an abusive relationship the only way to solve that relationship with a with with a partner who's being abusive is to walk away it's the only solution if you try to change that abuser it won't work if you try to convince them that uh that, that they should listen to you it won't work. The only thing you can do is walk away. So it's exactly the same for this system. It's not going to care if you demonstrate. It's not going to care if you try to fight it. Um, but it can't do anything if you walk away. So that's also the message is like, let's build the world that we would like to live in and leave behind this stuff, which is not 
It doesn't care about us. I could see the development through your story pre-COVID, during COVID, and now post-COVID. And you've recently rebranded COVID Positive News as the Conscious People's Network. And I'm really getting a sense of where you're going with that. But in closing, I'd like to ask you, why did you change the name and what's your new vision? So COVID uh, disappeared for most countries. It's still out there. And in some countries, um, there are still restrictions in place. But for, for many, many countries, especially in Europe, a lot of people consider it now done, dusted and over. Um, but obviously, this, is, this, this story is not over. And what I started to see was that people were now moving on to the next problem, which was war, um, uh, uh, central bank digital currency, which is your passion, you know, how to deal with that one. Um, and uh, what else? There's so many things going on out there. I charge new world order yeah all of this but, stuff but the positive end of it is conscious people's network yeah yeah so those people that uh found covid positive news and got benefit from it um i mean i've always said also from the beginning that we're all mentors we're all heroes we are the ones that we're waiting for and we are the ones that are going to create the change, not waiting for someone out there to do it. That, that's never the, the way that it works. You know, someone needs to stand up and we need to stand up collectively. Um, through, my, through my journey to be happy, which took me on to a spiritual journey, you could say, I've had experiences of the, the feeling of unity consciousness that we're all one and in quantum mechanics it's the same story you know we are all one and what we need to do <clears throat> i mean conscious means awake and aware is now that there's so many people that are becoming awake and aware to what's going on is we need to come together and we need to uh start creating this world that we would like to live in so as i saw that some people were kind of moving away from covid um it was like okay well then what what can we do now so what we can do now is that those people that understand that we need to focus on the world that we want to create we can collaborate together and so the Conscious People's Network, as well as coming out of the fact that I needed more balance in my life, because I kind of burnt out at the end of last year from just like all the, the, the content that I was putting in there. How can I reduce the content? And how can I make the next step forward in the direction that we need to go? And so what I decided to do was, is interview people who are, conscious, awake and aware, because I enjoy meeting people and enjoy doing the interviews. So that's bringing my enthusiasm back into it. But then also those people could then become admin for the channel itself and, it, and put their content into the channel, which means I don't need to do all the content and I can focus on what I enjoy doing. But then also those people putting the content into the channel are an example to the rest of the world of what we can all be doing. And the CPN community, which was originally the chat, the discussion group, is those people that liked COVID positive news, that see the value in focusing on the positive, that are doing the inner work, that are you know, looking for community and friends that think like them, that are not interested in focusing on the doom and gloom they're there and we can chat with them 
get to know them. There's a lot, a lot of people in there now that, you know, I'm starting to kind of know who they are. But they can also be interviewed if they want to be. And then they can also become admin and contribute what they're doing into the main channel. And then also all of these people can collaborate and network with each other and then just allow to manifest whatever is going to happen, whatever's going to come out of this for a better world. So the focus became kind of the next step. You've got, let's not focus on the doom and gloom. Let's focus on where we want to go. And then let's do it. So it's the kind of the action stage, I guess. But it also is about us because um, it's, it's also about like no hierarchy. We come down together. So it's going in, in, in the, I guess, uh, I always get confused with top down and bottom up, but it's going down to the people and the people together can create what we need to be, what, what the world that we want to, to, to create. Because there's no one organization, there's no one person out there who knows the best for everybody. But then we together can start to create that better world. Or I would say now, you know, what let's 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 aim for the best world that we can come up with. Um and um and then I and then I would also perhaps just quickly add that. Like, I, I'm not saying necessarily, you know, I, I don't like the political names of, you know, socialism, anarchism, capitalism. But if we talk about, say, anarchism, what it really means is, like, people are just uh, creating their own uh, communities. And then those communities just work, w are friends with each other. Mm -hmm. as they're trading with each other and things like this and i think this is what this is what needs to start to happen is that we need to start deciding for ourselves what type of communities we want to live in and if that community over there wants to have a hierarchical structure and this community over here wants to have nobody in charge that's fine as long as we're not fighting with each other and then this goes back to, uh, but I don't remember the name right now, but apparently the constitution for the, the USA, where the founding fathers of the USA, they looked to a particular nation, tribes from, um, you know, Native American Indians. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't remember that name of that like kind of nation of tribes, that, that collection, but it was basically a federation of tribes where they were living in different ways, but they were just would state where they would be there for each other if if uh, if things if they needed to, to uh, fight or defend or something like this. So because a lot of people say, well, yeah, but if you go down to just like a little community, then the big boys will come and just destroy you. Mm -hmm. But not if all of those communities are supporting each other and there for each other. And so um so that's how i imagine it will unfold but i don't know i'm certainly like not i don't want to spearhead any type of revolution or be the the visionary for some new future i believe my role is just to is is just to kind of hold space for that transition as we go from the old to the new it's just support basically through um and to and to just be there for people as they as 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 they wake up go through the whole process cognitive dissonance okay what now now i've been through it i've been through the stages of screaming out shouting to people this is what you need to know i've been through the stage of superiority where i thought that i was better than everybody else i've been through spiritual bypassing where you're sharing you know there's not much difference between bombarding people with it, with information about the new world order or bombarding people with information about how to be spiritual it's still coming from that ego state and when we let that ego put it to one side then we don't need to convince anyone of anything we just need to be an example of of what's of, of, of what we could do so i guess that's it really just being an example and holding space and 
seeing if I can find a way to help people to collaborate so that they can network, do interviews on each other's podcasts, mm -hmm. do workshops together, and um, however else it, it, I don't know if manifests. I've been using the word manifest a lot these last few days. It's not a word that I always use, but, but however it happens, however it, however it kind of takes form, uh, will, will happen organically by itself. Robito, that's so inspiring. Your whole journey that you've shared over this last, what's flashed by this, this last 45 minutes. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming on to this recording and for sharing your gems and your gifts with uh, my audience. And thank you also for the things that you've done and the stand that you've taken and the way that you've taken it because it's very special. Thank you so much. And yeah, we will continue to collaborate and we will see, you know, how this all unfolds. But I'm sure whatever happens, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, exciting. So yeah, looking forward to see what comes next. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ravita. Thank you too.